Please be opening your Bibles to the 14th chapter of the book of Luke. Luke 14. I would like for us to read together verses 25 through 33. Luke 14, beginning with verse 25 and reading through verse 33. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. Let me pause here in the reading. New King James takes care of this. But the King James Version, when it says, hate not his father, it means to love less. That's a very important point to keep in mind. Then verse 27, And whosoever brought us the human race doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost? whether he have sufficient to finish it. Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation, is not able to finish it, all that behold it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. Here's his application. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be a disciple. Now, mind you, verse 25 says a lot of folks were following. Great multitudes were with him. And he does what he has always done in his earthly ministry. He takes that occasion to teach a marvelous lesson. Some people read this and say, well, because he says, hate hey, not your father, mother, etc., that means I've got to just immediately become a Christian and turn against them. No, it just means you don't love them as much as you love Christ. Christ gets first place in your life. Then you see that he talks about people of this world and the day-to-day -day concourse of things. Even in building, you make sure you've got the funds to build and complete and even kings making war want to be sure they have the wherewithal before they go into battle or else they try to arrange some sort of peace. And therefore he makes the application so. That means in the light of what I just told you, let's reason correctly from it. Likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. And some people read that and say, well, when I become a disciple of the Lord, I must just leave everything. No, it means that whatever there is that would hinder you from being obedient to the Lord, you're willing to give it up. And that's the point that is made, that Christ comes first. And that's tied up in Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, out of that particular text in general, each one of us is individual disciples, which means a learner or a follower of Christ, as members of the church. When we obey the gospel, the Lord adds us to his church. Then we're saying Christ comes first. And whatever follows our decision to do what God says in whatever condition there may be that it applies, then there may be persecution that comes along. And it certainly did for the early Christians. Thus we have such things as Paul writing to the young preacher Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. 
Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's very much of a plain statement of fact. Now, that doesn't mean that every day you're having to fight lions or every day because of your faith you're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace or you're going to be crucified because of your faith. But it certainly means when you put Christ first, that means the doing of his will and the application of it in all areas of life, that there are going to be things come upon you that's going to cause you to have to sacrifice some things. It may be that your family disowns you. It may be that you can't keep the same job you have because what it demands of you, and in doing it, you can't be faithful and do it. And you can go right on down the line. Jesus, and I like to call it his vaccination of his apostles as ambassadors of the court of heaven for what he called them to do, had this to say, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, John 15, 18 through 21. Well, they didn't know at that time when he says for thy name's, my name's sake, what that meant. But Peter would say later on, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but glorify God on his behalf, or as the American Sanders says, in this name. That's the new name God named members of his household as Christians. It means one who is of Christ. That goes back to the disciple idea of a follower, a learner of Christ. And you'll remember that Stephen, the first Christian martyr, declared to the Jews, as they must have been getting ready to really tackle him in a bad way, he said, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers, and murderers, Acts 7, verse 52. If you go back under the Old Testament to one of those prophets to whom Stephen referred, Jeremiah to the apostate Jews of his day said, Come and let us devise devices against Jeremiah. Then he went down a little further to Come, uh, let us smite him with the tongue. And let us not give heed to any of his words. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 18. Then wicked King Ahab said this of the faithful prophet Micaiah. I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 8. Well, of course, he just told Ahab the truth, but the truth was not what Ahab wanted. So in his eyes, truth was evil. And I want you to think about this since more and more people are getting farther and further away from the influence of the Bible on their lives when at one time it influenced greatly people in their everyday lives. In fact, I'll throw this in in passing. I was doing some studying history last week and it was very interesting that this historian who was not a member of the church but he was saying, if you study anything of history in the United States in the 19th century, you better be familiar with the Bible. Because it played such a part in the average person's home and upbringing, the biblical terminology was used all the time to discuss normal particular things. And if you're going to be a good historian, you have to know the language that was used and I've heard that from other writers, but in this one particularly, he was talking about this as it related to a matter in the Civil War in terms that were used 
And he was saying that just shows you the impact of the Bible, and especially the King James Version, on the day-to-day -day operation of people in the terms they used. But in our day and time, the most simple things, the rudiments and the fundamentals and the first principles of the Bible have to be explained to a lot of folks. You can't take for granted that they understand certain words because they don't. Because they never hear it read at home. Their parents didn't and possibly even their grandparents didn't. And they haven't been going to any church anywhere. So the Bible is strange language. And when the truth has been ignored and rejected over a period of time, truth is evil to people. It is so jarring, and they haven't heard it, and they haven't lived by it, that like Ahab, he prophesies evil concerning me. Well, he's a prophet of God. He's telling you what you need to hear. It's the truth. But the church needs to understand that's the way things happen and the way things can get. Well, I want to, out of all these comments concerning persecution, especially the persecution Christians can undergo, that may be far more common than any of us being threatened with being burned in something or stoned or crucified, I want to talk about a specific kind of persecution. Slander. If you read in the Bible, you'll read of false accusers. False accusers are people who slander other people. Paul said in Romans chapter 3 and verse number 8 that it was a slanderous report concerning he and others regarding their teaching that they taught, let us do evil, that good may come. Now a definition of slander coming from Webster's is the utterance of a falsehood damaging to a person's character or reputation, and it gives the word libel. Now, even out here in the world among people who are not Christians and may not know much about the Bible, they can bring you to court and sue you for libel and for slander. So even the world can realize just how bad that is when it ruins a person's character. When you tell lies about them. Well, one of the things that the early church underwent is they were lied about. As Paul plainly says here, Revelation 3 8, I read the Romans 3 8. Well, it happens today. If the back in the day when people of the denominations were willing to study with you and listen, then many times they would bring up all sorts of things that the church of our Lord was supposed to teach and this, that, and the other about it that we didn't. But they had listened to others. Remember when Jesus was in the borders of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples, who do men say that I, son of man, am? I always say when you ask a question like that among people, then there's a class of people that come out. They reveal themselves. They're called the some says. Some say thou, this one, that one, or the other one. But then Christ said to the disciples, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter confessed out that Christ the Son of the living God. Now, how did he learn that? Jesus tells us. Flesh and blood did not reveal it unto you, but my Father is heaven. How did, how did the Father in heaven reveal to Peter or anybody else on that day that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world? Well, read John 20, verses 31. 31. Many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Well, John, why did you write these? These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing have life through his name. So when Jesus worked these various miracles, they proved that he was who he claimed to be, the Messiah. And the ultimate miracle was the fact that he was raised from the dead. And he would make statements during his earthly ministry you don't take my life from me against my will. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. So we need to understand that when we hear people saying a derogatory thing, 
maybe that assassinates another's character. Especially it has to do with our brethren, but really it ought to be the way we conduct ourselves dealing with anybody. Because we're people of the truth. Truth just does not drive you to talk evil. Evil being that which is untrue against other people. But we also should expect it from some people. If the Lord said to the apostles, well, they did this to me, what do you think they're going to do to you? That's the reason I said he was vaccinating them against persecution because he said expect it. Now this brings up another point, the reason I read Luke 14, 25 through 33. As we try to convert others, as we try to teach them the gospel and what's involved in changing from a person of a world and being a faithful member of Christ's church, then we have to get them to understand that all is not rosy. That you've got to be prepared to take up your cross daily and follow Christ. That is, there's a burden to bear. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's true. Are you able to stand it when your parents or your kids or whoever it might be in your family ridicule you? Or say, well, just don't come back over here for Christmas anymore or Thanksgiving or birthday parties. This kind of thing. In this secular, makes no difference religion type of society we've developed, probably won't run into that as much. At least when it comes to whatever religion you choose, no matter how much it supports, it's supported by the Bible or how little it is. But when it comes down to pointing out things in the area of morals, we may face more problems there than we did on matters of religion. Now, the Bible is the final say-so, what's right and wrong in morals, even as it's the final say-so when it comes to matters of religion. But if you wanted to see right now just how far down the drain this country's gone in morals, biblical morals, let's just rent a public hall somewhere and have five nights of lectures on the sin of homosexuality and see what you get. You'll find out a lot more than you think you know now about how wicked this world is. Or you could change several things that you add on to that. You might get by a little more if you were speaking on the matter of child abuse, especially if you're dealing with abortion. Then again, those folks that are so vehement on feeling good about killing unborn babies, they might be there. The demonstrating do you know what no telling what to disrupt what you're doing. And it's kind of amazing to me that the church throughout this country, knowing full well that members are sloughing off and apostatizing and churches are smaller and so forth, but you don't see brethren trying to get out to where they can reach the public. I think I know one reason why. I don't want to be slandered. I don't want to take a chance of a lawsuit. I don't want to take a chance of people not liking me or people really knowing just how strongly I feel about matters pertaining to God. Now, I say that because I remember very well back in the 60s that there were a number of efforts. We're going back in the 50s, a number of citywide efforts, nationwide efforts put on by the church to declare the truth of God regarding Christianity. Primarily, it was Christianity. But I remember all sorts of those things, and people did it. Now, when's the last time you heard of any of them? Well, there has to be a reason why. First of all, I don't think the church really is that compelled to be mindful of the charge God gave it to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I think we're just not that concerned about people outside of Christ. We're here, and they can come if they want to, and if they don't, hard look on them. Well, I can't find that attitude taught in the Bible. So what I'm saying is, if we're going to be as the church was in the first century, as it's taught in the New Testament, following the pattern of New Testament Christianity, then we have to say the things that need to be said to uphold Christ. Think of these songs we just participated in in glorifying Christ, magnifying his name. And we basically said in those songs, you come first and every thought, word, and action, we're going to stand up for you. And here's the point. If the spiritual body of Christ, of which we're members in particular, 
not willing to stand up and be counted publicly, who is? Well, nobody. Now I want to talk about this slander further and look at the Apostle Paul regarding it. Luke records in Acts chapter 17, verse 7, some he calls Jews of the baser sort, that they charged the Apostle Paul with doing things, and the Scripture reads, contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. Well, you know when you know what the New Testament teaches about the kingdom of Christ. Jesus made it very clear, my kingdom is not of this world. It didn't pose a threat to civil government. The Lord's church never poses a threat to civil government as such in the way God set it up and as it's taught in Romans chapter 13. But they knew this is the way with the paranoia of the Roman government and the emperor in particular and those who served under him, and they were appointed by him usually, they knew this is the way to get everybody up in the air and just make the accusation. That's all it takes. If you live as long as I have being a preacher, you know that certain brethren of the baser sort, since the scripture used that, I'll use it again because that's characterizing them the right way. They don't have to prove something. They know it. If they can just sling out a juicy morsel out there, it cuts you down. And if you go to preaching things that says to them, that they're in error and need to repent, many of them will do that kind of thing. Now somebody says, well, I just never experienced, you haven't experienced preaching the old counsel of God to a bunch of people over the years either. In Jerusalem, the Jews said of the Apostle Paul, after he had worked so long, this is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people. And Paul actually do that. And the law, did he actually do that? And this place, Jerusalem and the temple. And further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted the holy place. Acts 21, verse 28. Didn't do any of that. But you know, it doesn't take but one little match to ignite a powder keg or a dynamite. That's all it takes. And they knew that. They knew exactly what they were doing. Again, of Paul, it was said, For we have found this man a pestilent fellow. I think I haven't had those words quoted about me, but I know they felt that way about me, some people. And a mover of sedition. Well, that means to oppose proper constituted government. A mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world. Paul had a reputation, didn't he? And a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene, who also hath gone about to profane the temple, whom we took and would have judged according to our law. What was the attitude, the mindset, the viewpoint of these Jews who would not be persuaded by the gospel? There it is. We'll deal with him if we can, just like we dealt with Stephen years before that. And if Paul had been a Roman citizen and appealed to Rome and took himself thereby out of the hands of the Jews, they would have. Luke records further, Then the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed him, and that was Festus they're talking about, against Paul and besought him. In other words, they're begging Festus and desiring favor against Paul, that he would send for him, that is Paul, to Jerusalem. And notice they had concocted a conspiracy, laying wait in the way to kill him. Then the scripture says, And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. Acts 25, 2, 3, and 7. Well, to get what they wanted, usually they don't have to. These folks don't mind lying, folks, to tell what they know is not true. 
because the end result's what they're interested in. Get rid of this man. And some of us have experienced that kind of thing. And I don't know how a person is going to be active in the kingdom the way the New Testament describes faithful activity of Christians. And at some point or another, from some body or another, to one extent or the other, face this kind of situation. You'll remember that Paul himself wrote to the Corinthians in the second Corinthian epistle and spoke of being in perils among false brethren, among the various perils he was involved in, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty six. And if you want to look a little further, let's just look um, at another passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, <clears throat> verses 19 through 21. Scripture reads, And not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace, which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord and de declaration of your ready mind. Now, what's being said here is that they're gathering this money up as a collection for the poor saints down there in Jerusalem because a great dearth had taken place and those folks needed help. Avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us, providing things honest in the sight of all men or in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of all men. Now, he goes ahead and tells who was sent with him. In other words, I'm not saying you brethren are going to lie about me using this money. I'm trying to make provision where you know it can be verified as to what we did with this money we've collected from all of you. What well, would be interesting to see some of these preachers who are collecting millions over the television make that same statement that we're really using it for the reasons we said we wanted to. Well, all you have to do is read a little bit about them, see the kind of houses they're in, the planes they have, and the cars they've got, and all those things. And there's never enough. Paul's saying, we don't want to be thought of in that way. So each Christian is being taught here, take precautions when it comes to your reputation. Because people are out there that are going to charge you with all sorts of things, and they don't mind lying about it. So be sure that you provide things honest before the Lord and in sight of all men. That's an obligation that has to do with your daily Christian living as to what you do. And you see he took witnesses with him so that they would have that kind of backup to verify what they did with the money they received. Paul then spoke of those perils. And the more you read the New Testament concerning the church of the first century, the more you realize what they underwent that we rarely do. Oh, I think we can be slandered quite a bit. I think that hasn't stopped. But as to all of the terrible things that came upon them in the way of actual beatings and so forth, we haven't faced that too much in America because of the Constitution and laws of the land. That doesn't mean at times it hasn't happened. I don't care what the Constitution says. Somebody get mad at it, he can kill you. I know of a time, and it's listed in what little book. I don't think you can find it very easy now. Written about the preachers of the latter part of the 19th century and early part of the 20th century called Arkansas Angels, about the pioneer preachers up there. Tells about one man, you know, preachers used to hold these protracted meetings, and they'd stay in members' houses. And this man stayed in a house where the man of the house was not a member of the church. His wife was very devout. But they, he stayed in that house. The husband said, that's all right. But he walks in one morning while they're eating breakfast and just kills the preacher outright. <laughs> you don't know. There's been a many of people get whipped and knocked around and beat up and all that kind of thing because they spoke the truth. And beyond that, been all sorts of friends. Some of us experienced that. Remember 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Paul's inspired advice to this young preacher as he does his work. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Then in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, 
giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Then he goes ahead to list the false doctrines they would teach. You have to expect that. You don't want to expect it. You'd like to think that everybody you're exposed to is a teacher of the Bible. Well, they're, they're going to hunger and thirst after righteousness. But what is Jesus teaching when we start out in Luke where he talked about the cost of discipleship? We find, again, a familiar passage of 1 Thessalonians 5.21, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. That's an obligation we have. You, you cannot be faithful to the Lord if you don't use that. You've got to know about people and what they say because people will say about anything. But listen to this. That's just um, what had to be said there to the Thess Thessalonians. But Peter had something to say along that line in 1 Peter 3 and verse 16. He says, plainly, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation, which means manner of life in Christ. For it's better, if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. In other words, I'm trying to get you, brethren, ready to face being faithful and not giving up the faith because trouble's coming. Bad trouble's coming. And they don't mind doing these things. And it can very well begin with slander, telling lies about what you are. Then Leviticus 19, 16, you can see it wasn't new to the Jews. And then even when they were converted to Christ, that is, thou shalt not go up and down as a tail bearer among thy people. Leviticus 19, 16, that's always been wrong. A tailbearer is somebody that tells a tale, and he's not too interested whether it's right or not. Now, I won't keep going on with this because there are a number of passages, Titus 1, 10, Jude 8, Revelation 2, and verse 2, and on and on you can go. They either imply or explicitly state, don't lie about somebody else and don't believe a lie about somebody else. And if you don't know, prove it. And if you can't prove it, be quiet about it. And ask the person telling it, can you prove that? Do you know by the facts in the case that that's what the situation is? We rarely do that. Someone said, we were talking about, it might have been yesterday, when people will call the church building and in this three-ring circus idea of what worship is all about and good times and fun and all these churches advertising well that's what the church is all about for the family to get together and just have a high whole big time little is ever said about what does the bible teach concerning proper worship and all that but sometimes we get phone calls and it's gone on for a long time now and they'll say what do you what do you all do for our young people why do you all got this program and that program and the problem with us sometimes, we go on the defensive when we ought to go on the offensive. And my view is simply this. If you can call me about what we're doing, especially in those areas, which is not primarily the work of the church you set out in the New Testament, then my question is, before I attempt to answer those, you need to ask, why would you ask such a question? And next of all, I want to ask you, what are you bringing to help this church be closer to the Lord? What do you believe that's going to be an aid to this church rather than a hindrance to it? They don't ever think that way. People are very prone to practice on you what they condemn, what at least they think they see in you, what they condemn in you. Many years ago, something we had dealt with in contending for the faith, a fellow called me from Fort Worth, and he was a nice acting guy, but he was very upset. And he was telling me over the phone that it was wrong for me to criticize. I said, you don't believe that. Well, I set him back. No, you don't really believe that. You don't really believe it's wrong for people to criticize. Well, I do too. I said, look, you took the time to think the thing through. You took the time to find my number. You took the time to call me. And you just got through criticizing me. 
you don't believe what you just told me. What you really are saying is, I'm happy when you criticize what I criticize. That's what you really said. Because that's what you're doing right now. And there was a long pause. And the fellow said, I guess I am. He said, I'm sorry. He hung up. People do not like to think. And especially to apply to themselves what they're very ready to apply to you, whether it ought to be applied or not. We as Christians live in a real world. The Bible is real material to get you through this world, faithful to get to heaven. Slander is a telling lie against a person that ruins their character. The enemies of the church have done it. They will do it. And the sad part about it is some ungodly worldly members will do it against those who are faithful in the church. Now I have to ask the question, because I'm going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. John 12, 48 says the standard of judgment is the New Testament of Jesus Christ. I already know what's going to judge me. See it right here. Now what am I doing about it to keep me faithful in all areas of life in the church and to fortify myself to be truly a disciple of Christ and a faithful member of the church dealing with the world as it goes further and further down the tubes and hates righteousness. As Jesus said to the apostles, it hated me. It's almost like saying, you think you're going to hate me and not hate you when you live and do as I teach? We are the mouth of the Lord. We are the hands of the Lord. We are the feet of the Lord. We are the spiritual body of Christ. Christ is the head, but to get the work of the church done or the work of the Lord done, the church, the spiritual body has to do it. So I have to ask myself the question, what am I doing about these things? Let us be people of truth, beginning first in our own lives that we make sure we're consistently applying the truth to our thinking, speaking, and doing, and observations, and Looking at anything, whatever it is, let's apply the truth. That means a lot of Bible study on our part, but let's do it. If you're not a Christian today, the same thing that would allow you to become a Christian when this New Testament was being written in the first century is what's applicable today. You must believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. John 8, verse 24, Romans 10, 17. You must repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. You must confess your faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10, 10. Then you're qualified and you must then be baptized, immersed in water by the authority of Christ for and to the remission, forgiveness of your sins. There is no other way to become a Christian. Now, people may get mad at you about it. That doesn't change the teaching of the Bible. Your family may not like it. It doesn't change the teaching of the Bible. And the Lord wants strong soldiers of the cross. He doesn't want people to give lip service and then go on about doing as they please. So if you would become a Christian, then the plan of salvation is clear. The Lord will add you to his church when you're baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, Acts 2, 47. And therein you can serve him faithfully, proving all things and holding fast that which is good. As a child of God, how are you living? Will the Lord call you in the light of the New Testament a faithful member of of his family. You need to know. You need to recognize whatever there is in your life that is amiss that needs to be repented of, confessed, and prayed for. That's God's second law part. Whatever your need is along those lines, then we offer it to you now while we stand and sing.